Across all EA Sports titles, there are an infinite amount of ways to actually play the game. From simple couch co-op, to franchise mode, to playing games with your friends online, the possibilities are endless. But no mode has been as prolific to the NHL series, in my opinion, as EA Sports Hockey League. This mode, since coming into the franchise, has revolutionized the way that we play online with our friends, and was one that shaped the community for much of the 2010s. However, as we stand here in 2022, the mode feels anything but that, with the glory seemingly all behind it. The mode with such a rich history and such a passionate, almost hardcore following in the NHL community seems to have had a rise and fall recently. So what has led to the present day iteration of the mode? In this video, we'll take a look at the inception of EASHL into the NHL franchise and all of the updates that it's had every single year that have led up to this point. Some games may have had big changes, while some only minor ones. While I did do tons of research into the mode itself, some minor things in the deeper history may have been overlooked compared to the more recent titles, where we have a lot more information that's still around. With that out of the way though, let's go all the way back to when the mode was first introduced. In the EA Sports Hockey League, you can have up to 12 people playing at the same time. So that's six human-controlled players against six other human-controlled players playing anywhere in the world. Each person has their own individual camera uh, in the third-person mode to see the world from their perspective. You can have up to 50 friends playing on the same team. You'll have your own uniforms, your own team name. Your team will play against the best teams in the world with the goal of winning the first ever EA Sports Hockey League Cup. The coolest thing about this mode is you are the star. Uh, it's your name on the back of the jersey and you get to level up your character with the goal of being the best player in the world. We're tracking you all the time so you can be the best defenseman or the best center or even the best goalie. We've done a great job at EA Sports at putting you in the shoes or the skates of great athletes but now it's time for you guys to shine and for you to become the next superstar. With the release of NHL 09, the new mode that was EASHL was officially released upon the public, along with key gameplay features that we can see even today like stick lifts and flip dumps, this was a major year in terms of improvements and additions to the game itself. The mode allowed you to create your own player, pick its height, weight and player type like a sniper or a playmaker, along with customizing the player's attributes using XP to however you want your player to play in game. You'd be able to gain more XP as you progress through the game using the new player card system which is even now a catalyst for nostalgia for players. This new project ended up becoming a huge success as ESHL quickly became a fan favorite mode with over 400,000 players playing at least one EASHL game that year. The ability to play online with your friends against other people added a new layer of team play and fun that really wasn't seen in the game before. The ability to create whatever player you wanted made it much more complex than the already implemented online team play, where players would take control of real life NHL teams and players and play one specific position. Additionally, EA Sports added one of the biggest things that they could have had at the time being the EASHL Championships, essentially the dawn of esports events before it even happened today in which EA itself hosted the event through the platform to find the best teams in both Xbox and PlayStation to eventually be invited over to the studios to play in a live setting. Unfortunately, this didn't last very long, as NHL 10 would feature an online-only version of the event before it was eventually scrapped by NHL 11. To this day, we have not seen anything similar to this setup for EASHL since. NHL 10 would build on the EASHL mode by adding even more customization to your player with custom equipment. This all new customization not only allowed you to change the equipment that your player is utilizing, it also allowed the ability to have attribute boosts on each equipment, which would give increased ratings for specific attributes depending on what you wanted to have. This created more customization from an appearance standpoint but also from a build standpoint and having more freedom to cater your player to how you wanted to play. 
While it also added more customization, the ability to purchase some of the boosts rather than unlocking them started the good old pay to win idea in the community that continues to plague not only NHL but plenty of other games in this era for, due to microtransactions. From a competition setup, the EASHL season would go from a year-round schedule to a monthly season setup leading into the EASHL championships. This would allow for more flexibility for teams and players alike rather than that grueling 12 month long season it felt like. NHL 11 featured even more quality of life changes to the mode, with clubs now able to fully customizable jerseys. It seems crazy in this day to consider that teams couldn't customize jerseys until two years into the mode, but it finally arrived in NHL 11. Additionally, the all-new division setup brought in one of the most nostalgic features for players, the playoffs. Teams would compete in the regular season to earn their way to either the elite, pro, or amateur divisions, where at the end of each month they would compete in the single elimination playoffs. Winning the playoffs, especially the elite playoffs, was a big achievement back in, and with what we have now, a largely requested feature to return. Features like Practice Mode also debuted in NHL 11, allowing you to scrimmage with or against your teammates in a controlled environment. NHL 12 would feature only minor changes to the mode, with the biggest being able to have multiple loadouts for each position. Instead of only having one loadout that you had to change constantly if you wanted to change your position, you're now able to have a loadout for every single position, whether it be center, wing, or a defenseman. The performance tracker did get a bit of an upgrade in terms of more depth, as well as things like the monthly all-star leaderboard was added to the table, but for the most part, a pretty quiet year for EASHL in itself. While NHL 13 certainly had a lot in terms of engine changes and in terms of gameplay changes in general with the skating engine overhaul, in regards to EASHL, there's still very little in terms of changes through the menus or the quality of life of the mode. A big one is that they implemented an attribute cap for your loadout, so you couldn't go all the way up to a 99 in attributes. These caps depended on what player build you were using, so it added a new layer of depth when it came to build customization. Now, NHL 14 brought changes to the actual matchmaking process in the game, going from that division setup that led into the playoffs to an all new online season setup that we see even today. Teams will progress starting from Division 10 and would go all the way up until eventually they would hit Division 1, which would lead into the various types of playoffs. Depending on what division your club was in, that is where you would actually play your playoffs, whether it be Amateur, Pro, or the Elite Cup. Additionally, the way that the game changed the way playoffs happened is they went from a once a month event to a weekly event, but also with a double knockout process so teams could re-register for a specific playoffs if they so choose to. A few more quality of life changes were around as players were able to purchase specific types of boosts rather than a specific attribute. So rather than a plus three speed or a plus five speed, they would go to a plus three boost that you can apply to speed, to shooting, to whatever you necessarily wanted. Some would say, that NHL 14, or rather the NHL 14 Legacy Edition of the game, was the peak of EASHL population and overall playability in the mode. This age that we had from say NHL 11 to NHL 14 is what people would call the golden age of EASHL, as it was most definitely the most popular and the most hyped period of EASHL, and it feels as though players always seem to want to go back to this generation. As we move past this generation of consoles, however, things start to take a drastic turn in the mode. So when NHL 15 was officially released for the Xbox One and the PlayStation 4, people are originally very excited for the new graphics and the potential for new overhaul changes to their already beloved mode that was in such a great state. This rapidly declined in hype as we eventually found out that there was not going to be any type of ESHL in the next generation of consoles for NHL 15. In fact, quite a few of your favorite modes were actually left out from the new generation of consoles, which as you can expect a lot of people were not very happy about. The transition between NHL 14 and NHL 15, or rather the transition from the Xbox 360 and PS3 versions to their new counterparts, 
will become a bad omen for the future generation of NHL games. This would quickly become the dark age of NHL, or rather specifically for EASHL, as a mixture of clunky gameplay along with less innovation through each game passing made people a lot more and more nostalgic of their old generation of games and with the new generation leaving a bit of a bitter taste in their mouth. Now NHL 16 tried its best to reignite the passion for EASHL by eventually bringing back the mode itself. This definitely did not go without an overhaul on its return however, as gone were the days of the custom player classes and in were brought in pre-built player classes. These player builds all had a set specific amount of ratings, depending on the different player build that you select, and the attributes that we saw that were able to be customized in previous generations were now set in stone. This caused for a huge debate in how people wanted to have the game mode set up, as some players were very disappointed with the lack of customization that they had in previous generations, while others actually preferred the pre-built player classes as they meant that there was a good balance between the modes, and the pre-built classes meant that player skill was the only determining factor between certain player skills. If a player had a legend card and more XP in the previous games, you would think that they would have a significant advantage over someone who just picked up the game as they would have a lot worse of a player. Now they would simply be a matter of player skill over something such as customization. EA also decided to release NHL Legacy Edition in this year as they basically were taking the best position that they possibly can in the old generation of consoles and it was basically an NHL 14.5. This seemed a little bit too late as NHL 15 was when this really should have been released as the NHL 16 already had ESHL reintroduced and a lot of the transition was already going over there so by the time Legacy came out it felt too little too late a lot of people were pretty disappointed. With NHL 16 looking to bring back fans that were disgruntled from its old generation release, NHL 17 was jam packed with tons of new features for the mode itself. Even if some people were on the fence about player classes in the game, EA decided to introduce brand new player classes such as the hitting sniper, the jumbo playmaker and a puck moving defenseman as new player classes. So sure people weren't super happy about the classes in general at times, but more classes made sure there was a large amount of variety in all of the different classes, and a lot of the new ones they introduced, like the Jumbo Playmaker and the Puck Moving Defenseman specifically, were huge hits and were among the most popular classes amongst all players. Additionally, another huge feature that they introduced was the competitive player rating, which is something that you've seen in many other competitive games such as first person shooters. And it's still something that we see even today, this time with the ranked point system. While they did advertise that the competitive player rating was supposed to provide fair competitive matchups in both club and drop in games, your club's division and rank was still the determining factor in the matchmaking system, thus making the competitive player rating simply something that you can visually look at in an attempt to understand a player's skill, even if that wasn't always the case. I've always thought that the competitive player rating just wasn't fully utilized by EA to its best potential, and it's something that even in future releases, I hope that we can fully grasp and get what we're actually looking to achieve with this rating system. Large changes to the customization tool for both your EASHL player and team, such as all new player progression with prestige emblems, new player customization tools such as custom celebrations more team uniform customization, as well as new types of arena progression with the all new arena editor to customize your arena to however you like. Other things such as matchmaking changes with connection quality, server selections, and little things like if a human goalie leaves in club, that team will automatically lose the game adds another layer of competitive quality control for matchmaking games in general. NHL 17 ended up being one of the biggest improvements in terms of overall additions to the mode itself, pretty much to when we were actually introduced to the mode back in NHL 09. With a lack of innovation in the past couple of years for ESHL, this was a huge thing to have the mode come back with a lot of quality of life features that we can still see impacting us today. NHL 18's big feature has actually had another huge impact with us today as this was the introduction of threes in EASHL. 
Previously, if you wanted to play in a 3v3 style format, you would be playing with three human players, but you would still have all of the required AI players that would fill a full 6v6 game. The new overtime rules found in the real NHL allowed for EA Sports to introduce threes into the game and was a good way to have small games when you didn't have a full 6v6 roster. Things like new digs and a new defensive skill stick made a really nice addition to the gameplay, but in terms of quality of life changes, 3v3 was really the biggest change to NHL 18. However, NHL 19 would continue the trend of having that second year by yearly major overhaul, as this time with the all new World of Chell system. It was a huge revamp which brought in tons of new features to the game, such as all new customization, which include tons of more things to add to your player, with things such as uh, jackets, toques, and things such as uh, skates and new helmets with your sticks can add to pretty much every single mode. The addition of modes such as 1s and 3s on the outdoor rinks was very appealing to the casual audience looking for more ways to experience the game. However, I think the biggest changes came in terms of builds, as the player class system had the introduction of player traits. So while we still had the player builds with your default set number of points, traits would allow you to increase and subsequently decrease certain stats that you wanted to change. If you wanted to have a higher passing, you could most certainly do that, but at the cost of something such as like defensive awareness. While we aren't necessarily at that NHL 14 old gen level of customization, we were slowly creeping towards more and more customization while still maintaining that player build balance that they're hoping to achieve when they introduced this feature back in NHL 16. New gameplay changes such as the RPM skating really changed the way that the game played and honestly there was tons of new features that were added in NHL 19 and really almost topped all of the things that were innovated in NHL 17 and was a huge game for the mode itself. For everything that NHL 19 delivered in terms of new additions, NHL 20 seemed rather underwhelming when it came to the ESHL side of things. Realistically, the only thing that I could necessarily find in terms of new addition was that the 1s and 3s modes in the games were renamed or rather revamped to the Eliminator modes. This didn't necessarily change a whole lot in terms of how the game mode played out, but it was a lot more new cosmetics and new customizations that were previously brought in in NHL 19. So while I can't say there was a whole lot of new things, they simply built on more things that NHL 19 brought in. However, NHL 21 continued that bi-yearly innovation and good new additions to the game as they basically overhauled the World of Chell system. Gone were the days of the competitive player rating system and in came the new ranked point system into the game. This new system combined with new interfaces and a new navigation changed the way that things looked and felt when playing the game. New seasons for the EASHL year also came together with the eventual club finals that were brought in after every single season. This was originally meant to be a type of hybrid system that we saw in the playoff system of the old generation, but players quickly realized that it was far too long and far too tedious of the system. And with the club finals lasting for like two weeks, it didn't have that same type of excitement that you would find in the 360 era. While the rank point system brought in a lot of cool things, such as more colorful and more glossy ranks, with more visualization to the point system itself, the mode still didn't fully utilize that system for matchmaking, so we still had that issue even that we had when we first introduced the competitive point system. In addition to all of these changes for matchmaking, the trait system was completely overhauled, this time adding one and two variants to every single trait in the game. Each variant of a trait would have the same type of benefit, but would have different drawbacks. So if you would increase passing, one might decrease your defensive awareness, while another one might decrease your shooting, for instance. While this may not seem like a major overhaul of the type of builds, it had a lot more variety and actually changed certain viability for different traits as a lot more of different types of varieties of downsides changed the way that the meta of player builds worked. And of course, one of the big changes in the mode was the reintroduction to practice mode, a mode that a lot of fans have certainly been wanting from the past. And while fans were skeptical of people that calling it a new mode, 
In reality, it was something that was just taken out and now re-added. It was still something very fresh and very exciting that fans could most certainly be hyped about. Other quality of life changes include a new server selection for private matches, all new stat categories in the player leaderboards, and a new menu system that was a lot more streamlined and much more easy to navigate from before. And now we arrive to today. The new set of consoles brought in yet another overhaul to the way that World of Chell felt and looked as you navigated through the mode. The new dressing room allowed for more streamlined process, as well as the new party system allowed for you to get a better way of inviting players that wasn't as tedious when you're organizing games. The biggest change in the entire mode had to have been the reintroduction of custom builds, something that the community has been clamoring for for some time now. While these were not a one-to-one -one direct scale to what we had back in the day, a new sort of hybrid system where they utilize the trade system with the X factors as well as the custom builds had a nice best of both worlds system in it. It really had a nice way of maintaining competitive balance while still catering to people that are looking to get that level of customization that they were looking to have from their builds. It really feels like this is the best of both worlds, and I think that this might have been the most in-depth customization of any type of system that we've had in the past. I think this surpassed the NHL 14 saga, as I think it still had that balance that they were looking to achieve through the new generation with the traits. The shortening of club finals from previously two weeks to nine days also made sure that people weren't always stuck in the club finals as a lot of people were not very happy of the way that mode played. While there's still problems with club finals as well as the RP system, the minor changes they did add were some sort of a band-aid to the problem as they looked to go towards a more permanent solution. NHL 22 ended up kind of changing that off-meta inst installment of the series, as typically most major overhauls to the mode were based off of kind of a bi-yearly scale. NHL 22 seems to have changed that, as they had tons of new overhauls similar to what we had in NHL 21. Perhaps it's the start of more love that's going to be given to EASHL in the future. So we have now gone through over 10 years of EASHL and what the mode has shaped up to be today. From the 360 PS3 era, to the Xbox One PS4 era, all the way to the brand new additions. The journey that EASHL has had over the years has been quite profound. While I think this is still one of the most underappreciated modes of recent years, and the mode is still looking to get back to the glory years in the early generation, I think in recent years we've seen quite the shift of how the developers have perceived the mode itself. A lot more community feedback has been received and has come out with a lot of good positive additions to the game that the fans have been looking for for some time now. Could this be the year of EASHL as we look towards the future? We'll have to wait and see. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see more, definitely hit that subscribe button down below. Plenty more content is coming, but until then I'll see you guys in the next video.